Now, Stephen, as with all these religious traditions, what is the problem that Islam defines as the most central problem in the world? And what's the solution? Well, the problem is pride or self-reliance, the idea that you can somehow make your way through life and into the afterlife without God, that we humans are self-sufficient in some way. And of all the religions in the world, it emphasizes that notion the most. It really presses the distinction between God and human beings. And so the solution then to that is to submit to God. And Islam actually, sometimes people say Islam means peace, and it, it is related to the, to the Arabic word for peace, but it actually means submission. So the idea is, is that we're prideful, we want to pretend we can exist just perfectly well without God, but what we really need to do is to submit to God. And if we submit to God through techniques like the five pillars of Islam, which include prayer five uh, times a day, um, where you get down on your hands and knees and you press your forehead into the ground. Mm -hmm. It's a very submissive God. position. Yes, exactly. That, that uh, if you do that, you will be with God in this life and you will make your way uh, with God or Allah in, in the afterlife, into paradise. Mm. Are there other aspects of the technique for submitting to God? You talked about the five pillars of Islam. Um, are they all part of the technique? Yes, the way, the way to be a Muslim is very simple. Uh, and this is a missionary religion like Christianity and like Buddhism. And the core is called the Shahada, which is the testimony. I testify that there is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. If you say that and you say it sincerely and ideally in the presence of other Muslims, that makes you a Muslim, and that sets you on the path Toward, uh, toward paradise. But along with that first of the five pillars are these four other pillars. And I like to think of them literally as pillars because that's the metaphor we get from the tradition with the shahada as the sort of what's holding up the center of the dome maybe. And then the four corners of the building um, are these four other of the five pillars. And the first is prayer. And we've already mentioned that, prayer five times a day. And this is a prescribed form of prayer, both in terms of the words and in terms of even the body postures, in terms of getting down on the ground and in terms of sitting up and then and then leaning forward again and, and doing that submiss submissive posture to God. Um, the second is charity. Uh, this is something that we don't hear about all that much in the West, but it's giving to the poor, essentially. Um, there's a real emphasis in Islam on what in Christianity is called the preferential option for the poor in liberation theology. Mm -hmm. um, and you give not a portion of your income, but a portion of your assets every year to help the poor. The next pillar is fasting. And we hear about this particularly in Ramadan, the month of fasting in Islam, where from, from sunup to sundown, you, you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't, you don't have sex. And we've heard about this in the West uh, with some NBA basketball players who are Muslims who competed in uh, in basketball games when they were when they were fasting. And then the, the the last and sort of probably most visible in the world is the Hajj, the pilgrimage, where Muslims are obliged if they have enough money, uh, because this is expensive, to go to Saudi Arabia and to Mecca, where they stand and observe and participate in key moments in the life of the of the Prophet. Uh, Muhammad and experience as Malcolm X did when he went as a neophyte Muslim to Mecca, the unity of the Muslim tradition where the distinctions of Muslims of language and, and dress are sort of wiped out and everybody feels that participation in the Muslim community mm -hmm. together. So those are the ways to paradise and to submission to God. Mm, and it's multifaceted, certainly. And I'm wondering, of course, Muhammad is considered an exemplar of this, but are there other, and we're, we're going to come to him in a minute, but are there other exemplars in Islam who have been stellar examples of people who've done this? Well, there's a distinction in terms of exemplars between the Sunni and the Shia. So with, which are the two main groups in Islam. With the Shia, it's clearer. With the Shia, you have th these people called the Imams. And Imam means leader, or it literally means the person who stands up in front. And that can mean the person who stands up in front of the congregation for the Friday 
prayer uh, worship service. But in the, in the Shia tradition, which we see most visibly in Iran, you have this imam who's kind of like a pope who, who has the authority to speak on behalf of the entire community when it comes to religion. Isn't that closer to the Ayatollah? Yes, exactly. The Ayatollah was uh, an imam in, in, in Iran. That's right. Uh, but in, in that, so, so th- this is the example you would look to. Like, ha- how are you to submit? You know, how are you to follow this mus- Muslim path? You might look to the imam, but of course you look first and foremost to Muhammad, who, whose wor- who, not only whose words are exemplary, but also whose life. You know, if Muhammad wore his beard a certain way, you should wear your, your beard a certain way. Um, but in the, in the larger tradition, the, the Sunni tradition, of Islam, the the majority tradition, you have just the notion of the ordinary. You, you do have the imam who stands up in front of an individual congregation. So he's more like a minister than like a pope. You know, more like a local minister. And you would look to him for guidance and, and leadership alongside of Muhammad. But Muhammad is always the central, the central exemplar in the tradition. And you say in your book, God is Not One, that Muhammad is really different from the founders of other world religions in many ways. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's it's hard to overestimate the authority that uh, Muhammad had in the, in the Islamic tradition and that he continues to have because not only was he the vessel for bringing revelation into the world, and, and the parallel here would be the Virgin Mary in Christianity where the Virgin Mary is the vessel for bringing the revelation of God, the logos and word of God, Jesus, into the world. Here, Muhammad is the is the vessel for bringing that into the world. And like Mary is is you know pure and said to be without sin and conceived Jesus without having sex. Uh, Muhammad is is said to be illiterate, and so there's a sort of a miracle at the beginning uh, for Muhammad. But not only is he is he that kind of charismatic figure, starting off the tradition like a founder and bringing the scripture into the world. He's also a political and a uh, social leader, and he's a military leader. So he's, he's a lawgiver. He's a judge. He's, he's a governor of sorts, and he's a general in, in the military. So he plays the roles that in Christianity are played by Jesus and Paul in the first instance, and then later on by Constantine, who is the person who spreads the tradition. But Muhammad spreads the tradition himself during his own lifetime. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, I think he's the most influential of all the, of all the religious um, leaders in the world. And let, let's move on then to some other key concepts in Islam. Obviously, Muhammad, Muslims call God Allah. Uh, and how is their vision of God different from those of, say, the other Abrahamic traditions, Christianity or Judaism? Well, I think it's closest to Judaism. And the way I like to describe it is as a kind of a strict monotheism or a hard monotheism where Christianity says there's one God, but it tolerates the ambiguity of having a human being who becomes God or who is God, who takes human form in in Jesus. So you have these three persons, which seems to be to Muslims at least, a violation of the notion of monotheism. And so Muslims are much stricter about their monotheism. In this sense, they're closer to Jews, where you have in Judaism the prescription against, say, graven images and imaging God. You have that prescription against imaging God also in Islam. And so you don't have the traditions that you have in Christianity, say, of depicting Jesus in art, in Renaissance art, say. You have a, 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 a tradition of calligraphy where what is going to make it into art from the religion is are the words of the Quran. So people using beautiful Arabic script to render, to render uh, the truths and the beauty of the Quran. But God is different from human beings, and and what Muslims really focus on is maximizing that distinction. Don't confuse the human being with God. And that's part of this idea to go back to submission, that you need to submit to God. You need to not confuse yourself with God. And to confuse yourself with God is a, a, really a form of idolatry. And that's why something like cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad would be seen as so offensive in the Muslim world. Right, because that might lead toward a kind of divinization of, of Muhammad, but it's really the prescription against imaging God moves over into the prescription against um, against imaging Muhammad in the way that it, it doesn't say in the in the Christian tradition. Let me add just one more thing about God. There is this idea in Islam of God as being loving and merciful, 
but also being powerful and wrathful. And the tradition will talk about both of these, both of these things. And the Quran is really quite amazing on this score because you'll be reading on one page about how angry God is about the people who forget him. And then you read on another page about how merciful God is about the forgetters when they come back and remember and submit. And um, so this, this tension between kind of love and beauty on the one side and power and uh, wrath on the other side is quite palpable in, mm. the, in the Muslim tradition. And you mentioned the Quran, which of course is the holy scripture of Islam, and you say it combines both law and spirituality. Um, but I was interested in one one sentence you used. You said it reads page after page like a fire and brimstone sermon. Yeah, I. <laughs> one thing I try to do in this book is is to just give voice to my own. Uh, responses to these traditions. And one thing that really caught me as I was rereading the Quran to write God is Not One was just how much there is of the fire and brimstone, of the if you turn away from God, if you don't f- remember God, if you continue to forget God, you're going to be burning and you're going to be spitting up, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> bile. And, and uh, it's a bad place to be. Um, there really is really is a strong emphasis in the Quran on warning, you know, warning the evildoers, warning the people who have turned away. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, the carrot along with the stick, which is that paradise is this, you know, beautiful place of, of cool shade and comfortable couches and, and fruit and rivers, rivers of milk and of wine and of honey and of water. Um, but, but yeah, it's really... Um, it's really big in terms of the re- the rewards and the punishments. Mm. Pretty palpable. You also emphasize something I think that the average American probably doesn't know, that a persistent theme in the Quran, in both its law and its spirituality, is justice and poverty, this preferential option for those who are weak. Well, you know, this is one theory about how the tradition spreads, and it, it's a theory that's parallel to an argument about how Buddhism spreads. You know, one thing that Buddhism gives up on is caste. And and it has a competitive advantage among the poor and the outcast in India because, because it doesn't have the hierarchy of caste that Hinduism has. And similarly, Muslims really give up on, on the rich. You know, there's a, a really strong criticism that the rich are just oppressing the poor all the time and that Allah is on the side of the poor. And this is really clear from the Quran. It's really clear also from the secondary scripture, the Hadith, which records the word, the sayings and the, and the exemplary life of Muhammad, that um, God is on the side of the poor. And this is one reason why one of the five pillars is to, is to give to the poor. And this is one reason why so many people in, in world history have flocked to this tradition, which is now second in importance in terms of numbers behind, uh, behind Christianity. And you say, of course, that Islam is growing. It's, it's the fastest growing religion in the 21st, cent- 21st century. Do you think that's what's behind that growth? I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. I mean, it's, it's growing about a third faster than Christianity. We, we think about Christianity as growing like wildfire in Asia and Latin America and Africa, and it is. But Islam is growing even faster. There's a greater uh, birth rate, particularly. And Islam has has gone from about 12% of the world population to 22% of the world's population in the last century. And over that same period, Christianity has actually declined in terms of its percentage of the world population from 35% to 33 So it's growing really quickly. Um, it's growing in part because of the appeal to uh, the poor. It's growing also because of this idea that you know God has spoken and, and there is this revelation in the Quran. And, um, and we have it. And, and it's not corrupted in the same way that the Tanakh of Judaism is corrupted or that the Bible of uh, Christianity is corrupted. What do you mean when you say they're corrupted? Well, it's the telephone game that you hear about that, you know, atheists criticize Christianity about uh, quite regularly, which is that, you know, we don't have the earliest texts. We, uh, we have a different texts that, that say different things and they've been translated in, in different ways over time. And uh, we just can't really trust the Bible in the way that we can, we can trust the Quran, which, by the way, in the, in the, in the 
Islamic tradition is only scripture in Arabic. It's really interesting in America with the Bible. Nobody really wrings their hands about, gosh, we, we can't read the real Bible because we can't read Hebrew and we can't read Greek. You know, we sort of feel mm -hmm. like, hey, we have the Bible. Um, but in Islam, you really have to have it in Arabic in order to have, have the real text. Mm. How much room is there for interpretation in reading the Quran? Because I know Muslims do say this is the word of God. God is speaking. And they mean it in somehow more of a firm sense than a Christian or a Jew might. You know, that's a tricky question. I'm not so sure Islam is all that different here. I, I think that in all these traditions that have revelation, you have some people who think the revelation kind of speaks for itself. And you have some people who think it needs to be interpreted. We even have this in debates about constitutional law in the United States and the Supreme Court. You know, there's the people who think the Constitution just means what it says and there's people who think, well, it doesn't mean anything unless we read it and, and we have to interpret it. I think Islam has the same thing. I think the difference is, is that a lot of people in the Islamic world can't read the Quran. Um, the overwhelming majority of Muslims in the world do not speak Arabic, even though we associate Islam with the Middle East and with the Arabic language. Um, Asia is actually the most common place and Indonesia is the largest Muslim country and people in Asia and Indonesia pretty much who are Muslims don't, don't read Arabic. So they can't read the Quran uh, in the original and the original is the only place where there really is the Quran. And so there's, they're more guided, I think, by, uh, by clerics. And, and this is where there's a situation in Islam that's a little bit like pre-Reformation Europe with Christianity where the scripture wasn't really in the hands of ordinary people and they needed to be guided by, in this case, Catholic priests. And uh, we haven't had the Reformation that sort of put the Quran into the hands of ordinary people, either in translation or in, in Arabic through you know, mm -hmm. Arabic literacy programs. And so, uh, so there is more of a reliance on, on outside interpreters or interpreters who are, quote unquote, more qualified. Now, in t one term in Islam that's often misunderstood and misinterpreted today, and it's related to some verses in the Quran, is jihad. Some people say, oh, it means holy war. And other people will say, well, no, the first meaning of jihad is the struggle to be a good person. And other people will say, well, it's both. What's right? <laughs> oh, I'm right, of course. <laughs> Naturally. Um, you know, uh, but, you know, here's uh, – seriously, I, I think it's I, – I mean, it, the word means struggle. So there isn't a debate about that. Um, the question is, um, how has this word struggle been interpreted? And the answer is it, it has been interpreted both ways. It's been interpreted as holy war, as literally military action against uh, the enemies of Islam, um, typically in self-defense, even even with people who, who read struggle as um, – jihad as, as holy war. But it also means the inter internal struggle, the jihad that goes inside uh, each of us in terms of our refusal to submit, our refusal to uh, reckon God as being in charge, our refusal to give up on pride and self-reliance and um, self-sufficiency. I think it's a mistake to pretend that jihad has not been interpreted to mean fight and slay and kill because it does. It means that. And it's been read that way in the tradition for, for centuries. And so, you know, the side that wants to say, oh, Islam is about peace, jihad is really this term of inner spirituality, that, that, that's just disingenuous and not true. But similarly, the side who wants to say, oh, well, you know, jihad, I mean, you hear a lot of people say, oh, jihad is one of the five pillars of Islam or one of the six pillars of Islam. Sometimes people want to shove it in there. And, and, and that's just not right either. It's, it, it's not a tradition that has traditionally said that this notion is central um, and that has said that this is really about, about war. So the resources are there mm -hmm. to make it about war. The resources are there to make it about inner spirituality, but it has been used both ways. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that you point out that you can read the, what are called the sword verses in the Quran as really the rules governing what would constitute a just war in more Christian terminology, whereas in the Judeo-Christian Bible, you find lots of references and stories about war and violence, but there aren't any rules there about what you can do and what you can't do when it comes to war. Yeah, this is where uh, one place where I really think Islam 
is is way ahead of Christianity. I mean, I think you can say, oh, isn't it great that Christianity has a pacifist at, at its core in Jesus? And I think there's a good argument that Jesus was a pacifist, or he certainly seems to be. He's certainly not a military leader. But one problem with that is that once as a Christian you go to war, how do you follow Jesus in war? And the answer is you can't. You sort of have to give up on Jesus in war. And Christianity has to develop much later on its just worth theories that tell you how to do war in a way that's Christian. Because Jesus doesn't tell you and neither does the Bible. But in Islam, you get Muhammad and revelations of God through angel Gabriel to Muhammad that tell us how to do war, that tell us don't kill women in war, don't kill combatants in war, that essentially come up with a lot of just war theories of you know, proportionality and other things. Um, so it's there. But now it, it's tricky because, I mean, it, frankly, I don't know if this is a weird analogy, but it's a little bit like the question of, you know, do you educate kids about safe sex in school? And, oh, if you do that, then that's going to make them, you know, want to go out and have sex. If you, if you tell your tradition how to do war in a way that's, that's, that's fair and that's just, does that make them want to go out and, and do war? I don't think so. Um, and, and I think in the history of Islam— the constraints that were put on war in the Quran and in the in the Hadith about Muhammad and in the life of Muhammad himself have provided restraints on war rather than a sort of wild west like let's just go out and kill the bad guys. Mm. Okay. I'm going to try to finish this uh, this one up in about three minutes here so we can get through one more anyway, okay? Sounds good. Um, Sharia law. We hear a lot about it. What is it? Why is it important? Well, Sharia just means law, and it refers to uh, it refers to the idea that in Islam, you're told not just here's a scripture, not just um, here are some methods for personal spirituality, but you're told you know here's the right path, you know here's the here's the way to have a society. Um, w- one distinction between Islam and Christianity is that Islam legislates family life, social life economic life, political life. It tells you how to deal with criminals. It tells you how to deal with taxation. It tells you how to deal with interest. But that is Um, not in the Quran. That comes somewhere else, right? Well, no. Part of it's from the Quran. I mean, it's a a body of law that is rooted in the Quran and rooted in this secondary literature called the Hadith and then rooted in a series of of legal decisions that were done by by various jurists. And, um, you know, it's like the, tr- the rabbinic tradition in Judaism, where you have, we have rabbis who, who argue about, you know, okay, what, what's halakha here? Like, what's, what are we supposed to do legally as Jews? Um, and, and in this sense, Islam, again, is closer to Judaism than it is to Christianity, because Christians aren't told, you know, uh, this is what you should eat. You know, this is what you, you, you can't eat. This is uh, how the state should be run, right? I mean, there is more in Christianity of this, like, give to Caesar what Caesar's, give to God what is God's. Um, there isn't a church-state distinction in Islam or a mosque-state distinction. And so the tradition is going to tell the state how it should do its work. And this is, of course, very controversial throughout the Muslim world because there are states that have Muslim majorities that that certainly don't, in fact, most of them don't follow Uh, Sharia law. They don't try to create a state that is really perfectly purely Islamic in the way that the Taliban say is trying to uh, is trying to do. Of course, it has its own, you know, reading reading of the law of Sharia. So so that's what it is. And it points to the idea that this is a tradition that is really about the whole life of the of the person, the personal life, the public life, the political life. Mm. And of course, you alluded earlier to Sunnis and Shias. Why the split? Well, it starts off early on. It starts off uh, over after the death of Muhammad. And the question is basically, what kind of successor are we going to have? How much power will the successor have? And the key thing was, is it going to have to come from the bloodline of Muhammad or not? And the people who insisted on on the bloodline uh, went with uh, uh, Ali, the prophet's son-in-law, and they became the Shia or the so-called partisans of Ali, which is what Shia Ali means or Shia. And then the other side said, no, we need to go with sort of the, the best available person. And, and the, key, the key moves really are, are two. One is how much authority do you invest 
in the successor to Muhammad or, or the uh, imam or the caliph or whatever you're going to call the, this leader. And the Sunni invested social and political authority but not religious authority. The religious authority was decentralized in the community. What the community decided would go. On the Shia side, they invested the religious authority in the imam who we talked about before in this sort of pope-like ayatollah sort of, sort of figure. Um, and, and the other piece that was really important and became important particularly in the 20th century is martyrdom. There's important traditions of martyrdom among the Shia that go back to the, the uh, martyrdom of the grandson of Muhammad Hussein in the year 680 um, in Iraq in Karbala. And there's a memory, a powerful memory of that among the Shia that, that motivates uh, Shia to, to move toward a kind of martyrdom. And uh, that has been manipulated in the 20, 20th and 21st century to, to, to motivate martyrdom in the name of, uh, of Islam and even, even terrorism and suicide bombings and, and, and things like that. Okay. So, uh, so that, that's part of the distinction between those two, two traditions. And of course, there's a third group we hear about, which uh, called Sufis, which I believe you could be either Sunni or Shia and be a Sufi. What's a that's Sufi? Right. Yeah, Sufi cuts across those lines, and a Sufi is a mystic. A Sufi is someone who, like a gentleman I met in Jerusalem when I was doing research on the book, I was in a shop. He's uh, selling jewelry, a uh, very good jewelry salesman, I might say. I bought more than I needed, um, in part because we had this wonderful conversation where he said to me, you know, Islam has nothing to do with the five pillars. And, you know, in my chapter, in, in God is Not One, I, I focus on the five pillars. I say... You know, Islam is so much about the, these five pillars. This is right. this is the techniques, right? And uh, he said, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with that. You know, it has to do with with going toward the real. It has to do with loving God. It has to do with having God splash around in your chest. Um, it has to do with God being as close to you as your jugular vein. And um, and all the rest is kind of exoteric. It's kind of like external to the tradition. And so Sufis are the people who say. Uh, let's go to the heart of the religion, and at the heart of religion is inviting Allah into your heart and having him take over your, your life in a way that is beyond words, that cannot be uh, summarized in law. And so the methods for them are going to be things more like ecstatic dancing, right, the whirling dervishes, poetry, and song. Mm. And then finally, you point out that Islam has an enormous political spectrum in the world from Islamism— which is, of course, the very fundamentalist kind of conservative to the moderate and progressive Muslims. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is really important. You know, first of all, I think some people try to pretend that extremist Islam, this sort of politicized Islamism, as it's often called, isn't part of the tradition. And that's not true. It is part of the tradition. These are people who are drawing very much on the Quran and the Hadith and the law and who are... Um, Yes, defined in part by their conservatism, their fundamentalism, but particularly they're defined by their politics, which is centers around a hatred of the West, a hatred of Israel, a hatred of, of uh, America. Um, but that is a very small portion of the tradition, and most Muslims in the world fall into the, what we would call the progressive or, the, or moderate Islam. And I remember when I went to uh, Indonesia, I, I met a lot of different Muslim leaders there. And they really struck me how, how progressive they were and how moderate they were and how they were saying, okay, not only are Jews and Christians people of the book with whom we can have interfaith relationships of collegiality, but so are Hindus and, and Buddhists. In other words, their religious tolerance was extending well outside the Abrahamic tradition. I also noticed in Indonesia, I hardly ever saw women wearing headscarves, you know, much, much less you know, the burqa or the full kind of covering of the body. They, they hardly ever even had on, had on headscarves. And they had much more uh, open readings of the Quran in terms of interfaith conversation and, and religious tolerance. So, so the tradition is vast and broad, and we shouldn't imagine that everybody is progressive and favorable to the West, and we, neither should we imagine that everyone is a fundamentalist and hateful of, of the United States. Mm. So it's a very diverse religion within and the rising religion of the 21st century, as you describe it. 
That's right. I think I say at the end of, of my chapter on Islam that the 19th and 20th centuries belonged to Christianity, uh, the rise of evangelicalism, the rise of Pentecostalism, but the 21st really belongs to Islam. It's the tradition that we're talking about. It's the tradition that, you know, if I'm on a plane or I'm at a party and people say to me, you know, oh, you're a religious studies scholar. Well, tell me about Islam, you know. Um, it's sort of on, on everybody's lips, especially since 9-11. We want to understand what this tradition is all about. Okay. Stephen Prothero is a professor of religion at Boston University and the author of a book where you can read more about this. It's called God is Not One, The Eight Rival Religions That Run the World and Why Their Differences Matter. Thank you so much, Steve, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it.